It's Monday. I'm Dooner here with the dude, Michael Vincent. Hey, man. Rainy, stormy kind of uh, Monday afternoon here in uh, Freight Alley. Yeah. How you doing today, it's man? One of those days. It's one of those dark, darker kind of days. So, you know, it makes it a little harder to ease into the week. But you know what? You had, a hard, you had a hard time this weekend. People in Saudi Daisy who went to Zoe's Harbor Lights Marina. Now, imagine this. You, you, you're, you're super good, right? You take the yeah. whole time to the social distance and not go out to eat and you get your vaccine and you wait the two weeks and you go to your family gathering at that restaurant. 40 of you go on the deck there to take a picture and it collapses, injuring 11 people, 11 people injured. Yeah. At a birthday party, right? Took them an hour to get people out from underneath the thing. Five different ambulances coming through, et cetera. People injured, a couple critically injured. Yeah. Not what you'd expect. Scary stuff. Hey, you know, but Hey, and then again this morning in Atlanta, Atlanta, a uh, tornado touchdown in Atlanta this morning. We were watching it happen, happening live around 11 o'clock this morning. Looks scary. Little it's not headed this way, is it? No. A little bit of damage uh, was uh, reported so far, but uh, not, not a whole lot coming out of there. Hey, reminder, everyone out there, Mother's Day coming up this Sunday. Yeah. We tell you, shipping time's been taking a little bit longer, so you're ordering. Even if it's on Amazon Prime, get your orders in today, tomorrow at the latest, right? You want them there by now. Sunday. Make you need work. them here Are, for Sunday. You got any plans for Mother's Day? Oh, I'll have all kinds of plans. My wife will be... Uh, you don't want to give it away because well. they're no. viewers of the show. No, she's watching. Okay. See, my wife already knows. We're going to the Chattanooga Lookouts game right over there. Oh, sweet. Yeah, a little minor nice. league affiliate of the uh, the Reds. So we'll there see what's go. going on there. there on today's go. show, we're talking about the return of in-person events. I'm excited about that. You know, talk about these in-person to restaurants, right? Hopefully that doesn't happen to you at in-person events. But yeah. the baseball game, we're looking forward to that. It's going to be great. We're going to be talking about the return of logistics in-person events. There's some logistics that goes into that. And we're also oh, yeah. going to hear from... One of our friends who we met because of their struggles of raising funds without in-person events, St. Christopher's Truckers Relief Fund, Shannon Courier, is going to be with us. It'll be a good time. They're getting yeah, back I can't wait to get an update from her. We talked to her earlier in the year. Yeah, they have a really cool conference. virtual conference going on as well, a virtual concert, not conference, virtual concert coming up yeah. a little bit later in the month. She'll give us all the details on that one. But before we get there, let's tip the band. This episode is brought to you by Legend Transportation, which has been establishing partnerships through outstanding customer service since 2007. Learn more at newlegendinc.com. Here's the deal. Let's get to some headlines. Yeah, let's do it. Here's the deal that keeps on giving. It's the oversight <laughs> panel says Yellow increased its lobbying efforts ahead of this $700 million yeah. loan. There's just been a ton of scrutiny ever since it was mentioned, since it's happened, and that scrutiny continues to move forward mm. through a whole other administration. Todd Maiden reports the latest report from the Congressional Oversight Committee tasked with mon- monitoring COVID relief loans showed that LTL carrier Yellow Group, formerly YRC Worldwide, they changed their name shortly after getting this loan, by the way, was likely not as critical to maintaining national security suggested by the Department of Defense and the Treasury. The uh, the Friday report from the commission said that the carrier likely provided only 20 to 40 percent of the DOD's LTL services, not the 68 percent stated by the DOD Whoa. and the Treasury when providing the rationale for the $700 million loan made to the company. Well, that's a significant difference, isn't it? The report also <laughs> calls into question the company's increased spending on lobbying efforts ahead of the loan. Dooner, the CARES Act established various lending programs intended to save jobs and co- at, the, at companies that were facing COVID-induced uh, liquidity crisis. At $46 billion was established for the Treasury to fund loans to passenger and cargo airlines, as well as companies that met the national security designation, as we were talking about before. The Treasury made 11 loans under the national security carve-out with a bulk of the 700 Thirty-six million dollars going to yellow. Yeah, one got seven hundred, ten got thirty-six million. Yeah, so big. That's exactly right. Big split. There, big split there. <laughs> knocking my. So knocking mad my, he's uh, throwing stuff. I, I, I am. You know, this the stories like this get my blood boiling. The government it. received a thirty percent equity stake in Yellow, which was described as uh, in a precarious position at the time <laughs> yeah. as part of the lending agreement. Solid investment. 
A U.S. Transportation Command letter to the commission showed the DOD spent $24.9 million for yellow services in 2020. It spent $7 billion annually around the world on transportation and related services. $594 million is spent on domestic motor freight transportation. So if you're ever wondering what the DOD's freight spend was, there you go. $7 yeah. billion dollars annually. The Department of Defense spends just moving stuff around. Yeah. The, the report also called into question why are Yellow's increased spending on lobbying efforts in 2020, knowing the company spent $570,000 in 2020 compared to uh, no spend in 2019. Hmm. They didn't have to uh, turn anyone's hand there. And uh, the, that, that was the year they booked $100 million in losses. Yellow spent only $80,000 in 2018, wow. 75000 in 2017. So a, a big move up in 2020. Looks very suspicious. They're still looking into it. We'll see where it goes. No, I think it was all part of their long-term plan. Hey, another another lingering effect from 2020 was all this talk about SPACs, right? Yeah. The SPAC rumor mill churns over autonomous software developer plus. They've been up a few times recently where there's smoke, mm-hmm. there's fire. Alan Adler reports self-driving truck start, software startup plus is reportedly in talks to merge with some in, with some investor group that brought with the same investor group that brought public electric vehicle startup Canoe Inc., school bus maker Bluebird Corp., and flatbed logistics specialist Desky. Uh, rumors of the Cupertino, California-based startup aligning with the SPAC have circulated for months. Bloomberg reported Friday that plus is in talks with Hennessy Capital Investment mm-hmm. Corp in a deal that could be announced as soon as this week. So it might be another episode of What the Truck. We'll hear all about it. Yeah, there you go. According to Bloomberg, Plus would be valued at more than $3 billion and raise $500 million to $600 million through Hennessy's latest blank check company as a shell that raises money for investors in an initial public offering to target a company for merger, a SPAC. After a year and a half in which more than 500 SPACs have launched, the Securities and Exchange Commission is scrutinizing warrant accounting and whether financial projections should get liability protection. Traditional IPOs are prohibited from making future revenue and profit uh, projections. They've been doing a good job raising money in recent months, over $420 million, much of it from Chinese investors, Chinese EV market heating up bigly. Mm -hmm. It was a minority interest in a joint venture with Chinese-owned First Auto Works and begins production of level four robot trucks in China this quarter, and China may be the battleground because their regulations really seem to be moving a little bit quicker than ours. They're going to let these trucks on the road maybe before we do here, especially yeah. cross, uh, cross state lines. For yeah. them, I guess it would be cross provincial or whatever. Um, yeah. Plus, is one of at least six autonomous trucking companies that are trying to break into this space. Uh, a little bit on the market here. From our DHL Supply Chain mm-hmm. Pricing Power Index, tender yeah. rejections were down for the first time in weeks. But is it progress? Let's see here. The DHL Supply Chain Pricing Power Index rounded out last week at a 70. It was down from the previous week's 75. The long-term outlook looks to remain at 70. For those of you not familiar, the DHL Supply Chain Pricing Power Index takes several indices within Sonar, crunches them together, and dictates who has pricing power in the market. 100 is fully in favor of the carriers. Zero fully in favor of the shippers. So seven strongly in favor of carriers. Yeah, it keeps bouncing around that 70, 75. Carriers are still rejecting nearly one in four electronically tendered loads on a national level. But the index has given ground a little bit this week, this past week. Still many many regions across the country saw tender regions creep up. The southeastern regions, including uh, every Florida market, showed relatively tighter capacity. Both van and reefer rejections have fallen over the past two weeks, with reefer continuing a nearly two-month descent from an all-time high following the polar vortex in February. Reefer rejections sit at 43% down from 47% two weeks ago so a descent to 43 percent yes and that and that's why the index moved down a little bit i think what our freight intel group is looking at here is that this has been a long period of elevated uh volumes right elevated rejections they've stayed they've stayed at one and four for a long time here and um that just looks like to be i hate the term the new normal but it's been the new normal for about two months now it has, and we're heading into more of a peak cycle right now, too, yeah. right? So we would expect that these numbers, these drop to 24 in the van, and and the uh, 43% would tighten up a bit moving into the summer months. Now, a few months ago, we peaked at 332 on the rate per mile. That was very high. We mentioned that it was the highest mm-hmm. in terms of the index. It's fallen since then, about $0.04 cents per week. This week, it was down to 304 a mile, inclusive of fuel. That's for your national dry van uh, spot rate average. That's down just a little bit. Where we're seeing bigger movement, though, the big drop has been in reefer where shippers mm. are really getting crushed. That was at 390 a mile, inclusive of fuel. It's fallen 50 cents to 340. So a little relief in the market. Get the What the Truck newsletter. Go to FreightWaves.com slash 
WTT. We'll have the new numbers on the market, what we're looking forward to this week, right at the uh, the leadoff in the newsletter tomorrow, freightwaves.com slash WTT. But now we're welcoming back Rick Malchaw. He's industry business advisor at JJ Keller. He's going to show us how it's done in Appleton. Yeah, and how are you guys doing? It's a great Monday. Yeah, it is. Well, it is, it's kind of dark and overcast here. I'm not sure how things are going over in Appleton, Wisconsin. It has been rainy. We had a gorgeous uh, weekend, though, so I uh, was able to get uh, quite a bit of yard work done, and it was a uh, it was a good weekend. Uh, tried to get out for a uh, kayak paddle on uh, on Saturday, but the uh, the wind was uh, blowing at like 30 miles an hour. Uh, you know, even uh, little ponds had uh, waves on them, so uh, decided to do a no go on that one and work on the the yard instead. Now, you going single or tandem on that kayak? Uh, all single uh, kayaks, yeah. So uh, uh, for a while, my wife and I had uh, six of them, you know, one for uh, every uh, occasion. Uh, but uh, we are down to uh, four of them. So we have uh, each have a sea kayak, and then we have a, a traditional uh, uh, and transitional kayak that's uh, that we use on on smaller bodies of water if we're just doing a day trip. Nice. Well, hey, big time sport over here in the scenic city, but so is trucking. And in trucking, your kayak may not have a DOT number, but your truck may. How often should you be checking those DOT numbers, especially with Road Check Week coming up? Oh, yeah. Well, that's exactly uh, right. So uh, Road Check is uh, is this week. And you know, hopefully you, you've done your uh, due diligence uh, before uh, Road Check. But, <laughs> you know, ideally... Um, you know, you should have uh, real time alerts on if something has happened, uh, you know, with your USDOT number. You know, otherwise, I do recommend that you, you know, go out to Safer or go out, go out to the uh, SMS uh, uh, site at least uh, once a month to take a look at if there has been any changes, if it still, uh, you know, is a good representative picture of, uh, you know, what your operation uh, is actually like uh, or or not. And if it's not, well, bring it up to date so it is. So I think most people uh, realize that they, you know, need to update their uh, USDOT information every other year or biennially. Uh, but there's no requirement that you, you know, or prohibition rather, that you can't do it more often. So as your business uh, changes or as what you're hauling changes, uh, you really should be updating uh, that USDOT number. So, Rick, specifically, what should you be what should you be looking for? What should you be monitoring and, and updating that you're talking about? Well, you know, let's go over a, a couple of things that you should be uh, monitoring. Uh, you know, first of all, again, kind of the purpose of it is to make sure there has been no changes. But it's kind of like um, you know, identity theft or crediting monitoring. That's why you want to do it on, on certainly a regular, ongoing uh, basis. But really, you want to make sure that you're looking at uh, primarily uh, your vehicle miles traveled or your VMT, uh, the amount of drivers that you have, the amount of vehicles that you have, both power units uh, and uh, and trailers. Of course, you want to look at your uh, census data, your name, uh, your address, make sure that hasn't uh, changed. And then you want to look at your safety history. You want to make sure that uh, the accidents that are, are listed uh, on your USDOT number or towards your USDOT number, you know about, and they are reflected on your accident uh, report. And then you certainly want to look at your uh, violation uh, reports uh, as well and make sure that your drivers are turning in their roadside uh, inspection uh, reports uh, so that you can proactively, uh, you know, be addressing uh, anything, I guess reactively, but uh, addressing anything that uh, was found on them and then making sure they get uh, turned back in within the uh, uh, that 15 days. You also want to watch out for uh, red flags, as, as I call them. So the red flags might be VMT uh, outdated or no for hire authority or USDOT number uh, deactivated. Uh, th that's public information, and it can scare your customers, uh, and it can scare maybe even a driver that's uh, coming to to work for you. So if you're aware of what others are seeing, you can stay on top of it uh, and make sure that uh, it looks as clean uh, as possible uh, for others. Uh, you know, if you are required to have uh, insurance and have documentation of insurance and your insurance company is providing that information uh, to the uh, FMCSA, like for, for, for hire uh, carriers or uh, hazmat uh, haulers, you want to make sure 
that that insurance is in good standing. Uh, it's one of the uh, reasons that uh, uh, people's uh, or carriers' uh, MC numbers uh, are, are are canceled on them, maybe uh, without their awareness that that uh, occurred. And then, of course, you also want to just keep a track of of your scores as far as your basic trends. Are you uh, trending in a, a positive direction, for instance? What are the risks of not regularly checking your authority? Well, you know, I think the biggest risk is you don't know then what you don't know, right? So things uh, may have changed uh, on you, but you don't know that they changed because you weren't, uh, you know, looking at it. So, you know, out of sight is not necessarily a a, a good thing and no news is not necessarily, <laughs> you know, good news. And, you know, certainly if you want to be, uh, you know, have an action plan and you're really, you know, trying to take your operation uh, into a, a direction, you want to know what that is looking like, whether it's uh, for safety or whether it's just uh, for reporting uh, purposes. So, Rick, tell us what's the most, what are the common misconceptions about uh, or related to the DOT authority? Yeah, there, there's there's quite a few. I, I think the, you know, one of the common ones is, hey, if I have a USDOT number, well, then I can, you know, operate uh, in intrastate uh, commerce. And, you know, we had that conversation several weeks ago, and that's uh, just not the case. So, hey, I, I've got a USDOT number. You know, most uh, states uh, require a USDOT number. So I'm good, right? I can uh, do an intrastate move. No, that's not necessarily the case, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, for higher uh, intrastate moves. Uh, most states do have requirements that you uh, register with the uh, states. Another misconception is that, hey, if I have uh, vehicles that are medium weight vehicles, so 10,001 pounds uh, to, uh, to 26,000 pounds, but my state uses one of the higher weights. Let's say my state says that it's not a CMV until it hits uh, 26,001 pounds. Uh, then I don't need to count uh, that vehicle. Uh, no, you still need to count the uh, vehicle. The instructions uh, when you're registering for the USDOT number and when you're updating uh, the USDOT number uh, is to count any vehicle over uh, 10,000 pounds. And I think the last one probably would be uh, hazardous material. So, of course, uh, when you're reporting uh, and getting the uh, uh, the USDOT number or you're providing an interim update or you're providing the biennial update, you know, one of the questions on there is the, you know, divisions and classes of hazardous materials uh, that you uh, that you haul. And folks think that, well, I only need to record hazardous materials or let the FMCSA know that I'm hauling hazardous material if I'm hauling a placardable amount of hazardous materials. And that's just not, uh, you know, the case uh, at all. And I think the last one is, you um, you know, if I have multiple intrastate operations, so I have interstate operations in four states, it's okay for me to go ahead and get an intrastate uh, USDOT number in each one of those states. And that's not the uh, the case. Uh, you know, if you operate uh, strictly in your domiciled uh, state, then you can have an intrastate USDOT number. But having operations in multiple states, uh, by definition, as far as the FMCSA is concerned, uh, is a interstate operation. Rick, do you need to mm. update the vehicle miles traveled on the MCS 150? Well, do you have to? Um, you know, look, look, nobody's going to shut you down if you don't uh, update your uh, your VMT. But there's really two downsides of not updating your uh, VMT. If it's not updated at least every other year, you're going to get that red flag that I talked about. So um, on your safer uh, site, on your SMS uh, site, uh, you know, the analytics site for the uh, FMCSA, you're going to have right at the uh, top of the page a red letter warning saying VMT is outdated. And it's probably one of the easiest things to fix. You just have to uh, do a MCS uh, 150 uh, update, update the uh, VMT uh, to the uh, to the current mileage and the FMCSA uses the previous uh, 12 months uh, uh, for miles. It used to be the previous uh, calendar uh, year. And then that red flag uh, warning goes away. In addition to that, you want to keep your uh, your VMT updated. Uh, and you want to keep it updated primarily because the unsafe uh, driving uh, basic and the crash basic 
both take into consideration the, how many at bats that you have. So mm -hmm. if you're driving a lot of uh, miles, just like the accident rate per million miles is, you know, one of the factors that's uh, used. Uh, it's also used in the scoring, comparing you to your peer group uh, for your accident uh, rate and your unsafe uh, driving uh, scores. And so you want to keep that uh, updated. Yep. Hey, Rick, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Our fireside chat with you one more time here on What the Truck. I'm sure we'll catch you again soon. Take care, brother. Hey, we appreciate you. Have a good one. Take it easy. All right, Excellent. now we're going to take a trip over to sunny San Diego. Although, you know, I used to live in Southern California. Yeah. And it's probably, what is it, 9, 20 a.m. over there? It's a little early. Sometimes you got to wait till around like 10, 11 o'clock for that, that June gloom or that marine layer to, to, to burn off. So we'll see what's going on with <laughs> Lawrence meant... Lansky. He's the founder and CEO over at Flock, Flock Freight over in San Diego, California. Oren, how are you? I'm um, well, thank you. And you're absolutely right. The, uh, the, the morning uh, marine layer and the early June gloom, May gray, I guess we'd call it, is already affected. <laughs> yeah, you got to go with that. You got to go with uh, something that rhymes a little bit there. Um, so tell <laughs> yep. us a little bit about Frock Fleet. Uh, Frock, Flock, Freight. it's like a tongue twister for me. I can't <laughs> speak. Flock Freight before we jump into things. <laughs> It, it, it is. You know, I, I struggle with it every day as well, even as the founder. Um, so Flock, yeah, we do algorithmic carpooling of uh, less than truckload partial freight volume LTL. So effectively, we're uh, using really killer advanced software to create shared truckloads. So kind of an, an old concept, the idea of putting things together to make uh, the whole truckload industry more efficient, give our customers higher quality. Um, something, though, that we've kind of scaled up and, and added a tremendous amount of technology in order to automate the entire process. And, and the first to market with what we call Flock Direct, which is really just a guaranteed shared truckload. So the idea of going to a, a shipper, a customer, and saying, instead of sending your four pallets, six pallets, eight pallets through the LTL hub and spoke, we can guarantee at the point of purchase that we'll move it as part of a uh, truckload, as a shared truckload. We do the same on the other end of the spectrum. There's a tragic number of full truckloads that are paid full, but aren't really full. I think it's I think it was kind of a dirty little secret of our industry um, as a massive percentage though of a lot of air that's being shipped. So instead we can we're in the business of matching things with matching things so we could fill those trucks up. Now it makes a lot of sense, Oren, because you, you have, like you said, you have a lot of air moving around there. And when you get into the volume spot market contracts like LTL. Uh, it's very difficult for LTL companies to manage those type of things. Some of them uh, don't do so well pricing those. And like you said, going through that hub and spoke when you've got a 15,000-pound, five-pallet uh, uh, yeah. shipment is not a, exactly desirable. So as you're putting these things together, how, how, how does this work with those, those carriers and those shippers as far as uh, making them feel comfortable with their shipment moving on with four or five other people's shipments on a, on a, less, than, or on a, you know, a less than full load? Yeah, it's a it's a really fair question. Uh, we we didn't. We, I guess I should say we had modest trepidation in the beginning. That would a customer be concerned that their again their fifteen thousand pounds, their eight pallets is moving on board with someone else's? And what we realized very quickly is that there is none at all because the reality is the alternative. I think life is about next best alternative. So without us, it's going to move volume LTL. It's going to move as a partial, maybe via consolidator. Um, you know, it's going to be moving with other people's freight, albeit through hub and spoke or through terminals or consolidators of varying types. So what we're doing is actually not any different. In fact, what we're doing, um, the, the differentiated portion is that we're putting it directly on a 53 footer. We're going to move it directly as a full truckload. We're never going to touch it. The freight is going to move hub less, as we call it, meaning it's going to get loaded into sequence on the trailer. So it starts to get a little complicated, but simplistically, um, the way it's loaded on the trailers, the way it's going to be unloaded off the trailer, we're never going to mm -hmm. rework or cross stock the freight. So from the customer standpoint, there are no touches It's it, other than you know the original loading and the unloading of the freight, but it's never going to be moved around in between. Um, and customers who ship LTL or volume are very used to their freight moving with other customers' freight. With us, it's actually far less so. You know, I want to talk about something here that I saw on uh, Flock Freight's um, on LinkedIn here. You're talking. So I'm excited about in-person events coming back. And one of the things that you are doing is this spring breakout furniture road show that uh, starts May 11th in Dallas. Looks like you're going to a number of different locations. You're, you're doing some of the conference logistics. Tell us about this. Yeah, I'm glad that you opened it up the way that you did, because that's exactly how I feel about it. We've been locked down, all of us, in varying ways, shape or form, you know, for better than a year now. 
Um, you know, I suppose six months ago, something like this would have been in Las Vegas or Orlando or, you know, at the Gaylord in Dallas. And it would be a conference with, you know, maybe tens of thousands of, of freight nerds like ourselves to get together and talk about all manner of freight. Um, the reality is that's not quite there yet, although the, the indicators certainly look really positive, maybe on the back half of this year. So this was an opportunity to be a part of a uh, almost like a mobile sort of show or conference uh, where we could support a, a great industry that's near and dear to my heart, the office furniture industry. My first business more years ago and, and far less gray hair ago than I, than I want to admit over 20 years ago was a truckload carrier actually specializing in, in blanket wrap, if your audience is familiar with that. So I've moved a lot of office furniture in my life as, as a carrier. Uh, so getting an opportunity to support them, uh, particularly in this kind of coming back to life out of COVID, I think is really fantastic. It, it's kind of, I think of it as almost a virtual show. It's real. <laughs> There's going to be carriers out there and shippers and um, exhibitioners, uh, but it, it won't be sort of, you know, walking the halls of one of the large convention centers. It'll, it'll be kind of out in the field. But I think it's a great kind of maybe baby step toward getting back to, to the real world. It's really cool. I, I like the concept of doing those roadshows as well and coordinating all that between with all these different carriers as you're going to move this stuff through your yeah. uh, through your network is going to be quite an undertaking uh, to do that. Aside from that, though, you guys are very interested in, in, in uh, a lot of altruistic things like, you know, with Earth Day and cleaning up the communities. Can you speak to some of that stuff? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, maybe if I can, I'll just hit on the the, the logistics, you know, pun not intended of, yeah. of this show. Um, I think it's really an opportunity for Flock to shine and do the thing that only we do, and that's to take lots of LTLs, lots of partials, take trucks that aren't full, and put them all together and do so with technology and automation. So, you know, anytime we have an opportunity to kind of shine and, and do what we do in the differentiated way we do it, we're, we're really excited to do so and excited to support. If we really think about the office industry, you know, office real estate, office furniture, they've really been adversely impacted as much as anybody over the past year. So I'm um, glad to see them really turning the wheels back on of, of their industry and, and get those pe people back to work as well. Um, in terms of our commitment to sustainability, uh, something we're super proud of, uh, two things. One is we're the only certified B Corp in freight. So uh, B Corp is a, is a community of companies that have demonstrated quantifiably with data uh, a commitment to sustainability and the ability to, you know, help do their part for the environment. So the flock direct, the shared truckload uh, business model, we've been able to prove um, is 40% more efficient from a greenhouse gas perspective. So that that's done two ways. One is, of course, if trucks are fuller, then uh, you're moving more freight on the same number of vehicles. So you don't need to bring more trucks um, onto the road. So that's a, that's a very good thing for sustainability. And then secondarily, um, you can imagine in, in sort of the traditional hub and spoke terminal environment, you've got a lot of trucks that are actually never quite full or never completely empty going back and forth between the uh, terminal and the field. In our case, we're moving those things via shared truckload of the full truckload industry, which it just simply runs less miles. Um, additionally, we launched about a month ago uh, carbon neutral offsets with our partner carbonfund.org. So we're the only company I'm aware of that's able to offer our shippers at no cost when they buy Flock Direct, when they buy the share truckload. We're able to completely neutralize and offset the uh, carbon emissions uh, along with the shipment. So what we're really trying to do is is create that win-win-win environment where, you know, the shipper gets higher quality by moving their otherwise kind of volume LTL, LTL freight via the truckload industry, via shared truckload. So they get much higher quality. We're trying to make sure that carriers make more money by being more full, if not completely full, and having opportunities to increase income. And at the same time, do our part for sustainability and for the environment in, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and do it all off the back of some cutting-edge technology. Now, Earth Day is great, but that was a couple weeks ago, Michael. Vincent, let's look forward to these conferences. I still want to talk about that. What are some of the challenges with servicing the, the conference space? Because that's one of those things where when something has to be there, it has to be there. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think if you really unpack Flock Freight and what we do, it's bringing the very high quality of the truckload industry, which obviously we take no credit for. Truckload is a, is a massive, fragmented, in a good way, lots of people out there, lots of independent owner operators, small and medium sized fleets. It's one of the rare industries that's really not dominated by the 800 pound gorillas, you know, the big mega guys. They're, they're, they're fantastic. They're huge. But really, our industry of truckload is one of, of the little guy. Um, and bringing that little guy super high quality, again, that, that's my background, to the LTL customer 
who needs that opportunity. And, and you know, I don't want to disparage anybody in this fantastic industry that is, that is freight and supply chain logistics. I think it's fair to say, though, that the, the LTL hub and spoke has been optimized uh, for the movement of, you know, two, three, four, five pallets, six pallets. That's what they do, you know, really well. Um, I think that they, from a pricing perspective, would support that statement I just made. That's the sweet mm-hmm. spot for them. And, and all of us, we can't be all things to all people. I mean, we know not to try. So um, we love that space that's kind of four, five, six pallets and up. We actually think of a shared truckload, 22 pallets, 20 pallets. I mean, that's a truckload to everyone else. To us, that's a large partial. We love it. That's an opportunity to put that freight with some other freight, give the customer, you know, again, really high quality. If you think about these conferences and shows, um, you know, again, the whole sort of trade show um, environment, to your point, I mean, I used to do NCA Final Four stuff on the carrier side. I mean, the show must go on. The pressure is extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And all the time you would see that stuff ship truckload, not because the weight nor the space requirements typically, but because of the the um, the time the timeliness, the qualitative requirements, uh, you needed a, a firm, you needed a mode that could be that precise. So what we've done now is, again, we bring that super high quality truckload industry to everything that isn't quite full without paying the penalty, without paying for the full cost of that truckload. So an opportunity to partner um, here and bring that high truckload quality and be able to hit 8 a.m. on a Tuesday. You know, as opposed to saying Tuesday, you know, maybe Wednesday, uh, it may drag into Thursday, but rather say, hey, we get it. It's only eight pallets, but we can do 8 a.m. on a Tuesday for, for pickup and delivery. Yeah, no, I get it. And I hear what you're saying, too, because if I was running conference logistics and I was in charge of making sure the boots were there, I'd be like, let's not go LTL because you don't want your your boots yeah. or half your boots sitting on a deconsolidation yeah. floor in the hub and spoke system. Well, you're supposed to be doing a demo or something to that effect. But it sounds like Flock Freight's changing that. Everyone's looking for LTL capacity. Everyone's looking for this visibility. Where should we send them to? Uh, flockfreight.com is always a great place to get started. Uh, they're welcome to reach out to me, uh, Oren, and it's an unusual name I know, O-R-E-N, at flockfreight.com and get them uh, pointed into the right direction. You know, we are, we're always, you know, we're, look, we're growing like crazy. I mean, like crazy. So we are a hybrid company. We're about half, you know, world-class technologists and we're about half world-class freight talent. So, you know, anybody who thinks that this may make sense to them on the on the customer potential shipper side, we're not only looking for for people to partner with and support, but we're also looking for feedback. We want to build something really special. So anybody who's got an idea out there and thinks that we're not quite addressing it the right way or a way to make this firm even better, we would we would love that. Thanks, Oren. Hopefully we Excellent. see you at our in-person event, November 8th to 10th, right here in Chattanooga at F3, the Festival of Freight. Those of you out there, you want to join all of us, live.freightwaves.com. Use promo code WTT. You'll get $200 off your ticket. Thank you once again to, to Oren. And I'd also like to thank our friends at Legend Transportation for sponsoring today's episode. Legend partners with strategic customers while providing seamless solutions for its drivers and is West Regional's premier freight transportation company. Learn more at newlegendinc.com. Now on this theme of conferences, we're going to stick with it. We got Shannon Courier now. She's the director of philanthropy and development at St. Christopher's Trucker Relief Fund. Great friend of the show. Shannon, thanks for it's good seeing you again. Hey, nice to see you guys too. Thanks for having me. What's going on? You're hanging out with the Dukes of Hazard at this Highway to Hope uh, <laughs> concert. What is going on? I'm looking at the uh, the billfold here. You got Winona Judd. You got John Schneider. I think John Schneider, he's uh, he's Bo Duke. You got Billy Dean. He's not my lover. You got Lindsay Lawler and you got Heath Sanders all playing. <laughs> We do. We've got some big names coming out this for this concert. I'm so excited. It's one of those things where, you know, I, I'm a dreamer and I'm like, you know, let's reach for the sky. And so I have these big ideas and I just start reaching out to people that I think can help me make them happen. And and luckily this one came together quick and easy and everybody said yes. And so we're very excited about it. It is very exciting. And there are some big names on there. Yeah. I can't wait to watch. <laughs> how did you guys get this thing together? And uh, tell us more about it. Where, when, when, where, how do I get involved? Yeah. So um, I started having this awesome idea for a virtual event because, you know, so many events were still being canceled for 2021, which we were not happy about. We're hoping to get back and, and you know, face to face with people this year and hopefully second half of the year we can. So I actually reached out to my friend, Donna Horton. She's actually at Radio Nemo. And um, I said, hey, I, I know you're a personal friend of one on a judge. Here's what I want to do. Uh, can you hook me up kind of thing? And she's like, you know, I don't know. Let me make a call, see what happens. 
And Winona said yes, pretty much the same day. And then she said, hey, let me call up my friend Billy Dean, see if he wants to be a part of this too. And mm-hmm. he immediately said yes, because he's already connected to the trucking industry with Averett Express. And so he was an immediate yes as well. Um, and we had just inked a deal with John Schneider just a couple of weeks before, because he has a new album coming out called Truck On. And it is, you know giving props back to the trucking industry and to the men and women that are behind the wheel. And he's always appreciated them. But during COVID, uh, he and his wife did some traveling, you know, in their own personal RV. And they were trying to find parking and fueling. And they just noticed really overwhelming number of trucks out there. And so it really just kind of was a smack in the face. And they said, you know, we need to do an album that really um, honors the trucking industry. So that's what Truck On is. So we had just inked that deal so I called him and said, hey, we've got this deal with, with Winona and Billy Dean. Would you want to be a part of it? And he actually knows Winona already and her husband, Cactus. So he was an easy yes. And um, Lindsay Lawler was already a friend of St. Christopher Fun. And then he, Sanders, came about. I was talking to an agent and I was like, hey, you know, I had an artist in mind that I wanted. And that artist was busy. And she said, but I've got this new artist, Horizon Artist, coming up. He's connected to the trucking industry. He used to be in the oil fields. Here, take a listen to his music. And y'all, I just fell in love with it. His name is Heath Sanders. So, so excited to meet every one of these people. I'm so thankful to our presenting sponsors, Averett Express and Nastic. Um, this wouldn't be happening without Donna Horton, all of these artists, and Nastic and Averett Express. Now, Shannon, what song are you looking forward to hearing most at this event? Oh, my gosh. Don't I... All of them. I want to hear all of them. All. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> They're all singing about five songs. And so I've been interviewing each artist individually. So I have individual podcasts that I do with St. Christopher Fine. I've been in, interviewing everybody individually. So we'd love for everybody to listen to those. We just want to give everybody kind of an inside view to each one of these artists and, you know, where they came from, what their connection is, why they wanted to be a part of this. So those are out now at truckersfund.org and we'd love for everybody to pop over and listen to those. But I, you know, I'm a huge country music fan, so I, I'm, I'm ready for all of them. I've been listening to all of the songs that I didn't know because John Schneider songs are new. Heath Sanders songs are new. I've been listening to them all because I want to know the lyrics. I want to sing along. So, well, well, you know, the, this is a virtual event, right? But the mm-hmm. thaw is starting to come off uh, it, on our own. Like we just mentioned it, November 8th to 10th, we have uh, F3 happening right here in Chattanooga. That's our first live event, bringing the industry back together. You're probably hearing more and more about live events coming back. That has to have you excited, right? I am so excited. We haven't even gotten past this event yet, and we're already talking about what next year's could and should and might look like. We have not billed this one as the first annual, but we're hoping it'll actually turn around and be the first annual. We've already got a couple of the artists that said, sign me up for next year. So, yes, very excited about the possibility of in-person events. Yes. Yeah, talk a little bit more about that, the importance of those events to you guys, Shannon. You guys did, thir- what, 3,194 truckers that you guys have helped. I'm sure it's it's counting up all the time. $3.5 million plus spent. And we met you last year when it looked like, man, funds were going to be difficult to bring in. Yeah. Can you talk about the importance of that and the importance of people of supporting your, your fund? Absolutely. So the in-person events uh, for me are very important because I'm, I'm a personal person. I, I like to meet people. I like to build a relationship with people. And although we've had great success with that this year virtually, it's just not quite the same as being in person. And we don't get to come face to face with the drivers. You know, the drivers are such an important piece of of what happens at St. Christopher Fund. They have always been our largest supporter uh, base. That's where most of our funds come from. Um, even if Even if some of our fundraising is done by a corporate entity, The funds that come in are actually coming in from individuals and from drivers. And so getting face to face with those drivers and being able to thank them and, you know, give them, answer their questions and just get to know them. They get to put a face with us, get to know who's behind the money that they're donating, get to meet people that have actually been impacted by the donations. That's all the things that happen at a virtual event. And I know I'm desperately missing that because I'm an extrovert and I like to talk to people. And so this, this concert is actually going to be my first in-person event in, you know, over a year. And so I've already told everybody there, look, I'm a hugger. So I'm just, if you're, if you're, if you're okay with a hug, just meet me at the door. If you're not, I won't touch you. But if you are, meet me at the door because I got to do some hugging. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. 
<clears throat> so you, can you talk about your uh, uh, the relief fund? You announced a new partnership with with Ping. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we have this new partnership with Ping, and it is, we're actually, you know, we just started it. We have a promotional code with Ping, and you can get a discount when you sign up with them. But what that is, is it's a, you know, we don't need to be on our phones while we're driving, and I'm going to say that I'm guilty of it too. So finding a way not to do that is is important. And so that's what Ping does, is it gives um uh, it's an app that you can download and sign up for, and you do have to pay for it, but it's going to give the the messages that it's going to read them out loud to you. So you don't have to pick up your phone. If it's something that you desperately need to respond to while you're driving, you, you can hear it out loud. You can say, okay, I need to stop over here in the next few minutes, get that responded to, get back on the road. So it helps read. It's like kind of like your GPS. You know how your GPS talks to you out loud so you don't actually have to look at it, hopefully, most of the time. It's kind of what Ping does for all of your messages. So that's a new partnership, and we're going to be pushing it out and explaining a little more what that looks like here in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned to our social media for that as well. Shannon, we can't let you go without spinning the wheel of stupid questions. Ooh. Michael Vincent, take it away. Spin that thing around. <laughs> round and round it goes. Where Uh-oh. it lands, nobody knows, but I bet we'll get a good one today. Read it off. All right. So what is the worst motel you've ever stayed in? Oh, my gosh. The worst motel I've ever stayed in. It is. Uh, do I have to say the name of it? Uh, if you feel like it, you don't have to put them on blast if <laughs> you, you don't, don't want. have to. <laughs> We're not going to put them on blast, but there's one in Knoxville, Tennessee that is. We lived there for 22 years, but there's one that's there that is is not not very good at all. And my husband used to have to stay there for work. And he's like, you know, hey, come stay with me this weekend. And I was like, dude, never again. I mean, the floor seemed wet and sticky all the time. The air mm. condition didn't work. The door wouldn't lock. I mean, you know, the pool area was was dirty. And, the, you know, I, I just... I guess I'm a hotel snob. <laughs> I, if I'm going to go stay in a hotel, I want it to be nice. <laughs> yeah. Not, you don't want the feeling of your feet like sticking to the carpet. Yeah, no, you got to no, bring your prison no. shoes. I, like I, I brought like not prison shoes, but like, uh, like <laughs> slide on slides you can wear in a shower. Yeah, you got to bring some <laughs> yeah. flip-flops. You got to bring them on. It's <laughs> gross. I can't even sleep on the beds. Like it's when we were going to Boston, my wife and I just drove straight through, even though we were way over our hours of service because we couldn't bear the thought of staying in a... Yeah, yeah so that was one of those places I didn't really want to sleep in the bed. The shower didn't work. I mean, it was just awful. It was awful. Well, Shannon, come to F3 in Chattanooga, November 8th to 10th. You've got to be there. Oh, I would love to. I would love to. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me on. Go to truckersfund.org. Purchase your ticket, $20. It's a virtual event. And listen, it's a one-time virtual event, okay? So it's not going to broadcast anywhere. It's not going to live anywhere after the event. So okay. when you get your ticket, you got to be there on the day uh, of to sign in or you're not going to hear it. But you don't yeah. want to miss oh, it. Right. Ephemerally advantages. Thank you once again, Shannon. And you know what, Michael Vincent? She should yeah. stay tuned because maybe they need a didgeridooist for their next highway. <laughs> Is that what hope. they are? Didgeridooists? <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, uh, Matthew Leffler, Vice President of Trail Solutions at VUB, is here with a very special Australian instrument. Hello, Matt. What's up? Hi guys, how's it going? Thank you for having me on. I'm so excited to play the didgeridoo for you today. I'm you excited have, for him to play it. You have a lot going on in his background, too. What is, what's behind you right now? Am I looking, is that Walter so, Payton up there? That is actually my high school jersey uh, oh. from when I played football. I have a bunch of different collectibles I've had over the years. I used to be, I'm an attorney, so I have some awards back there. All the things from my childhood, I my mom saved them, and I got them put away, so it's a nice yeah. place to look at them. I see a Wheaties box back wow. there. Is that, and he's, wait, you're yeah, an attorney? I'm, so he's probably got like yeah, a floater yeah. on these on this too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the Wheaties box, my mom put a picture of myself on this when I was a teenager and I've oh, kept okay. it ever since. Gotcha. It's incredible that how much parents can save if you if they have space to do it. So it's been a wonderful thing to see them again. <laughs> yeah. So I guess space is a big design. And you're you're in Chicago, right? So you have to be like USA Today gave the Bears an A. PFF gave the Bears an A plus. What are you giving their draft? I just want to see them do well. I mean, it, it's it's what are you, about what are you, their time mother? for the Talk about mothers. I just, like I just want to see them do. I just want them I to want see them have to fun playing a game and be healthy and have a great time. Exactly. No, no <laughs> questions. Nothing. I just want a good showing. Put all their effort into it. Would you have sat in Roger Goodell's used chair? I thought that was really awkward. They, did you see this, Michael Vincent? On no. the draft, every time a team would 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 draft, their suit like a super fan would just sit in his his uh, leather recliner that he did the draft in last year, and oh, he'd really? sit on 
the stage, just uh, no one would talk to you. You just awkwardly sit in the chair, you just until awkwardly the team drafted, sit there. Nice. and then some of the system would come by and be like, "Okay, next next fan up." <laughs> it's weird. It's like, if I'm if I'm asked if I'm asked, I will sit for sure. If I'm asked yeah. to sit there, any opportunity for sure. Okay, hit, <laughs> hit that didgeridoo for us. Let's see what you got. So what I have here is my CD case that I made when I was in high school a long time ago. Didgeridoo, this is a synthetic didgeridoo. The normal oh. uh, device is about 10 feet long. They're made of wood. It has a very melodic sound. So what I'll do is I'll play a couple of notes, and then I'll, I'll break out some additional sounds with this thing. Uh, I will mention my wife despises when I play this. So the opportunity to play for you today has made me so excited. I get to uh, tease my wife a little bit. So here is the didgeridoo. Mm. Now, you got a little noise there. I'm going to add a little bit of woo and get a little bit more exciting. So here okay. we go. All right. <laughs> and that is the extent of the didgeridoo's kind of sound quality. It yeah. is a beautiful instrument. It's been around for thousands of years. And I hope that everybody, if they have a chance to own a didgeridoo, you get it. It's just a wind instrument. You go, and that gets you this... <laughs> Sounds like a ship, like a like a ship horn kind of. Exactly. There's there's not there's so many use cases for a didgeridoo. So if I can have <laughs> like any ship horns real... broken, you could just blow into it if you're on the on the on the stand on the shores of Lake of Lake Michigan and, yeah. and and blow it during the fog. We're in inspection week right now. Grab your didgeridoo, your truck horn, just boom, you're good. You got it taken <laughs> care of. You got to have all of the resources to be efficient in this industry. <laughs> hey, you know, it sounds like family has had uh, a big rub off on you, though, for you got your mother saving all your stuff. But I think that you're also second generation in this business, if, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. My father started with Roadway back in the 1970s. And with Roadway, he managed maintenance all across the country. He oh. eventually went to a company called Airborne, which the, later became DHL. And in 1992, he had the opportunity to take a bid on a garage for a company called RPS. So back in the before time, you had Roadway, Yellow, and Consolidated Freight. RPS was the, the, um, became FedEx Ground. And we were the largest vendor for FedEx Ground for about 20 years. We had California. We were a maintenance provider. So we grew that business. I left the day-to-day -day practice of law to, to see my father's business and see this industry. And immediately I gravitated towards it. So we built the company up. In about 2018, we sold the business to Dickinson Fleet Services. I was a vice president for Dickinson. So I've been in the industry now for about a decade. And I know, as, as I've seen everybody, you don't get out of it. Like, you don't get to leave it. So I've been in different software companies and different maintenance companies. But absolutely, I, family's a major part of my, my, uh, my background in this space. Yeah, that's awesome. I was a roadway guy back in the day with RPS, et cetera. But uh, let's talk about V-Hub. Very interesting. I was on a website screwing around looking for some trailers and stuff. Can you tell us about what it is, what it does? Absolutely. So the industry trends that we keep seeing are connected, autonomous, electric, and shared. Sharing assets is a new thing. You had uh, just a briefly a little bit ago, um, someone talking about, uh, the, I think it's flock freight. The idea of taking a truckload and making that split apart so you have other assets, other sets of loads that can go in there. Trailers are the same way. If you have a trailer and you're not utilizing it as well as you could, you could take that trailer and make it on a sharing platform. Find additional revenue for your idle assets. What we know, what we know is that you cannot get trailers right now. Between 2019 and 2020, 111,000 fewer trailers are manufactured. In the OEM space today, there's not enough wood, there's not enough rubber, there's not enough everything. So if you can't make more, you can take what you have and drive better utilization. So then the question is, if there's no trailers right now, how do you find people who are going to let you utilize their trailers? Is it is it removing that friction and, and creating this an app like this or a program like this that people have visibility on it and... How does that work? Exactly. That, this is a great question. So when you're talking about carriers, every carrier has different ratios for how many powered assets they have and how many trailers they have. So if you're a fleet and you're running a one to two ratio, you probably don't have excess trailers. But if you're running a ratio of one to three or one to four, those assets may be idle. And if you don't have freight to find or at least profitable freight that you want to get, take a trailer, put it on a platform, let someone else use it. And by the time you have like our average rental right now is about 45 days. So the people who are using 
using VHub are either companies that are trucking companies that have idle assets or rental companies that say, well, let's have a digital platform to show our inventory and the pricing. Because the goal for us is to eliminate the friction points that happen when you rent something. And renting is just another way of talking about sharing. So getting paid for the asset that you have and driving that utilization. So, Matthew, when you talk trailers uh, and assets on, on VHub, what are we talking about? Just dry van or are you covering reefers and uh, flatbeds or what? That's a great question. So as of now, when it comes to trailers, it is any type of trailer. So what we talk about is dry vans, reefers, containers, chassis, dump trailers, all of those um, types of trailing assets, we have the ability to share those. And ultimately, what we see the path forward is making it any type of commercial asset being shareable at scale. And that's what we really see as, as the pathway for VHub. Now, you used to sell home theater equipment at Best Buy. So I got to ask you something. Would you do you recommend uh, like a sound bar or do you think you should go in for like the full 7.1 Atmos system? I have been so impressed with the soundbar technology. So the old days, it was getting a 5.1 surround sound system, all the hard wiring. People said, don't get speakers that have Bluetooth. They don't sound as well. I love soundbars. The convenience alone makes it amazing. I will mention just not being paid for plug it, but Roku just developed the soundbar that goes with the dongle. It's incredible. It's incredible. So and for my own purposes, if I'm doing a, a thing for myself, I'll just do a soundbar. If I really want to do a home theater experience, and probably someday I do, I would go probably a 7.1 or 7.2 system. It'd be, it'd be incredible. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Should we? Uh, I, yeah, let's, let's spin it up. Let's, spin let's it up. try the uh, wheel of stupid questions. <laughs> yeah, let's Matthew. spin around. Oh, see lands. There's no such thing as stupid questions, just stupid people. Uh, I, don't know. <laughs> I might well, be one of them. We'll that may be true. That may be true. Hey, what do okay. you got for him? What do we got here? All right, brother, this one's made for you. What's the stupidest thing that you got in trouble for in school? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would say one of the things that I started was wearing costumes regularly. So non-Halloween <laughs> costumes. Oh, yeah, okay. And at, at first it was like, what is this guy doing? And then it was like, oh, well, it's this, he's doing it. So I called it casual Wednesdays. Well, how and old I were you? Brought that, how old I would have been 16, right? That's when I had the, 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 <laughs> okay. the desire to do this. Okay. And many of those costumes, I still have them. And I would do that at undergrad. And I did that in law school too. Because it was, it was just fun. Like yeah. I want to bring capes back. It's a, so that was the, probably the, that would be the thing I think would be the one I would I would hang my hat on. And he's a lawyer too. So it's like argue with me about why I can't wear this costume. Tell me why I can't wear this costume. Who says Absolutely. I can't wear this costume? I got you. My six, my six and four year old are right in the same boat. Like whenever they want to go outside, they want to wear like, Spider Man costumes. They want to yeah. wear the Miles Morales costume. Yeah. You yeah. know, they want to wear the Thanos costume. They always want to wear a costume. And I, I, I fully support it. I, I'm, I have I'm with the uh, bring the cape back movement. I like it. Yeah, dude. I have an eight year old and a five year old, and they love to do adventures like this. And it, any opportunity I can to help them have a more immersive experience, that's what I want to do. My, I have a Pooh Bear costume that I used to wear in high school. My five year old has a version of the same exact costume, and we go outside and we, we run around with wooden swords and we make ourselves look ridiculous. Well, hey, thanks for LARPing with us today. We really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to reach out and connect with you and play a little dress up, where should we send them to? Find me at vhubapp.com. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Facebook, vhub. Uh, we are the equipment sharing platform. We try to make equipment smarter. Thank you guys so much for letting me be a part of the show. Hey, well, I'm going to give you a little cowbell before you go. You know, it's your first time. <laughs> Boom. There you go. There you <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care. So, Michael Vincent, you probably have a good answer. I'll give you mine. The dumbest thing I ever got in trouble for school. I was in second grade. I went to... Um, and we actually transferred. I was living in Staten Island. We transferred. We'd moved back to Massachusetts. I was going to the school, St. Joseph's. And St. Joseph's Catholic school, right? Catholic. Um, yeah. Actually, this one was co-ed. It was Catholic co-ed. Tuesdays, we had, we had mass day. So you'd have to go to the church that was attached to the school on Tuesdays from noon to one. So one day, I'm, I'm in church, and it was, uh, it was like one. Sorry, it was after lunch. And I was trying to, I was in second grade. I was trying to squeeze, trying to squeeze some air out. I'll, I'll put it that way. And it ricocheted. You know the pews, like the wooden pews? It just, it, it just hit it with such I force. I can't believe you're telling this it story. It just echoed. It just <laughs> echoed throughout the church. And, like, one of the nuns called my mom, and my mom was like, well, wh I mean, what am I supposed to do? It's a natural. It wasn't intentional. I swear it wasn't intentional. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I got in trouble in school. My mom was sort of like, if it happens again, you'll get in trouble. But, like, since it was a one-off experience, like, just try to not do that. <laughs> 
that's that's pretty dumb. I can't believe I got in trouble for the same thing in church. Oh, did actually. you? But not in school church. But oh, okay. just, 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 just but I absolutely did. That's what yeah. I was thinking. I think the other one was you know just you know chewing in school and and because I did it like constantly. In fact, oh, yeah? four months free right now. But uh, yeah, just turn around and spit right on a teacher's shoe. Oh wow! And, and yeah, like that. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, that was, was that a big dumb. deal or a little deal? We'll let the, we'll let the audience deal. decide. Hit the music. <laughs> big deal. Little deal. Well, some people may have thought that was rude of you to spit on their shoe. It was rude. <laughs> you know, they used to call it just, so when I was in Catholic high school, they called it justice under God when you got detention. It was called like jug, justice under God. Yeah. And you would get it for like chewing, not to, uh, chewing tobacco, but chew, chewing gum. You might get suspended yeah. for tobacco. You would have. Yeah, probably. Yeah. For gum, you would. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, brothers took it pretty seriously over there. Yeah. Uh, Insurify has released its list of states with the rudest drivers, and Virginia has taken home the title for the second year in a row. Is that a big deal or a little deal, dude? Well, I, you know, being rude driver. I mean, it can get when it goes to rage, then it's a big deal. I yeah. think I think the bigger deal here is that I, I can't believe it's it's not Miami because I lived in Miami. And they're pretty rude. Well, Miami's in not Miami. a state. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, okay, so <laughs> Florida then. Okay, sure, Florida, Florida man. Yeah, well, Florida's a big state. I mean, it looked like when I was looking at this list, it looked like a lot of the violations. Almost, I, I think all of them for the top ten were either running stop signs or running red lights, not necessarily like flipping people off yeah, and yeah. spitting at them. Yeah, <laughs> and spitting at them exactly. The other thing was that Ohio was number six. I'm from Ohio. I didn't find. Yeah. Yeah. to be rude drivers. I was disappointed on. Massachusetts wasn't number one. I guess we got to try harder. So big deal or little deal? I guess it's uh, a little deal. Yeah, I'll go with I you. think it's interesting, but little deal. So I'll here you go. You. Big deal, little deal. Right. Trucker was charged for a hit and run in Duluth, Georgia Ooh. after forcing a car into an intersection. Uh, you got to check out this. Look at this. Look at this. Yeah, so Look here's the thing, too, with this video. So, you, you know, with video, it's hard to tell. There's no sound or anything. But what really doesn't play into this trucker's favor is that it's not the first car that's in front of him. There's no. clearly a car ahead of the car that he's pushing through. So it's not like this car could have gone through the intersection. I'm not sure why he was retaliating against it, why he pushed it through. A witness came forward. They said this driver, his name was Henry Kane. They said he did a U-turn here, and then another driver followed him all the way to a restaurant, and then he just played dumb. He was like, I, I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I, I, I didn't see the car. I didn't know he was there. You buy that? I mean, it's sort of like the last one. No one got hurt, so can you say it's a big deal? But it's very dangerous, just like running red lights and stop signs. Very dangerous. It's not a. It's it's a compelling looking video. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, little deal. Yeah, potentially right. big. That's but how about this one? A man, a man was hospitalized after the porta potty he was using at the historic Gettysburg battlefield was crushed by a tree. Is that a big deal or a little deal? I, I, again, it possibly big, but uh, apparently was a little. Well, I guess it was a big deal. They had to use like the jaws of life to get him out of out of a porta potty. Out too. of a porta potty, that's yeah. a big deal. Even though he didn't get crushed, he was he got minor injuries. I guess he was okay, but it could have been bad. He could have been killed. So it potentially could have been bigger. But still, you're trapped in a porta potty for an hours, and they got to take yeah. you out with the jaws of life. That's a big deal. And what, like, you probably get, like, ju- like yeah. when a tree hit it, you're probably getting porta potty stuff on you. And <laughs> Were you about to say juice? <laughs> juice, yeah, right? <laughs> I don't know if it's, well, it's just juice. like that. You know, when you come out of a porta potty, you, like, you almost feel like there's, like, a film of you, yes. like a film on you. It's just, yeah. And then imagine having a tree. Yeah, you have to go take a long shower after I using one. No. Well, uh, here's, uh, here's, here's one that gets you clean, bro. Uh, yeah. So we got detergent applied right. to the roofs causes a British Columbia Creek to fill with foam. Okay. Big deal, little deal. Well, give that to me one more time. What happened? So uh, they put um, detergent on the top of this these this apartment building to keep moss from growing on it. Okay. And then it, I guess it rained or something, and this this creek filled with foam, like eight feet high. Well, if you if you watch the video <laughs> version of it, you can see the foam on all these roofs here, and it looks like a dusting of snow, but it's yeah. like it's there's a big dichotomy there because it's obviously the middle of spring, so there shouldn't be <laughs> snow. Like, yeah. how does that look better than moss? I, I the moss bl- and like, why know. did they not think that this would result in what it resulted in? What I think is a big deal is this contractor seems completely inept. First of all, he said this was a good idea to put it up there. Yeah. Second of all, he didn't foresee the fact that all of this detergent that any young kid can know that's played with either the Dawn or yeah, the detergent. Sure. It there's a lot of foam very quick. Or you've watched any home sitcom. This this kind of stuff happens. Well, now the rivers and streams are running with this stuff, and this inept contractor is like, "Yeah, I don't think it's having an impact on the fish." Meanwhile, people are like, "Yeah, my dog is all irritated." People, are, there's got, it's like it's like making nature swallow a Tide Pod. Yeah, there's absolutely apparently no negative effect on the marine life. 
there. I would say, <laughs> I I believe say that's a pretty big of all the things that we were here. Deal. That's a pretty big deal. I think it's a big deal. I mean, I don't know. Obviously, they never living in Florida. That's what the high school kids would do, man. They throw these detergent <laughs> into the into the into the fountains outside of the the uh, communities and just all, blow them up with foam. All awesome. this week's big deal, little deal, baby, do was question just the decision making of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah, I got a great idea. We'll keep this hey, moss from growing. With we won't question your decision making, though. If you go to live.freightwaves.com, click on upcoming events, click on F3, buy a ticket to F3 happening November 8th to 10th. Use the promo code WTT. You'll save yourself 200 bucks on that ticket. Everybody is going to be there. Every, and you know how much you're going to want to go? Because it's taken a while for things to open back up. Slowly yeah. but surely they are. Yeah. This Mother's Day, we're going to that baseball game. Looking forward to it. F3 right here in Chattanooga. 30 plus locations. The South by Southwest, the Coachella of Freight, it's going to be massive. It's going to be huge. You're going to be there. We're going to be there. We're all going to be there. Shen's going to be a hug. And on Twitter, at Timothy Dude, that's T-W-R. Find him at Vincent the Dude. Tell him what to do. Peace and love, everybody. Peace and love.